welcome to Penn's Pals. My, day, my name is Miss Dawn. And I'm Miss Camila. We want to welcome you guys here in our audience and you at home for watching our show today. Today um, we're going to do our Thanksgiving show and uh, Miss Camila and I have gathered some dry goods, some non-perishables for our food pantry here in town called Master's Mana. And would you like to tell us a little more about that, Miss Camila? Oh, absolutely. Um, today, what we want to do is we want to help with our community. And we know Thanksgiving is a very special time of the year. So I wanted to ask you guys here in our audience, what does Thanksgiving mean to you? Being with my family. Being with your family. Me too. About anybody else, what does Thanksgiving mean to you? Watching football with my dad. Watching, Watching football, I like that. <laughs> what else? A lot of people don't always have a feast to come home to. So we are very fortunate in Wallingford that we have a place, Master's Manor, that collects food um, for the people who need it. So I wanted to thank you all here today for bringing something for us. If you'd like, we could put it right into our box that's going to go to Master's Manor. So if you have something, feel free to just get up from your chairs. You can put that in the box. Thank you. Wow. So exciting. And we cur encourage all of you families at home, um, if your uh, students bring home papers from school for uh, a food drive for our local Master's Manor or any other food pantry in the state, we pray that we ask that you would just, you know, open up your, your cupboards and open up your hearts to be generous this Thanksgiving. Absolutely. And also, Penn's Pals will have a drop off location. So if you are interested in donating, please check our website and we will let you know where we will have that drop off location. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, today we're really pleased to have you here. We have a little bit of an older audience today, and we thank you all for coming and being brave to have uh, to keep us company here on the set. But we have also a guest who is an author, and his name is Jason Markey. Jason, welcome to Penn's Pals. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And before we go into his story, which also has to do with a little bit about Thanksgiving or a character from Thanksgiving, we are missing somebody on this stage. Can anybody tell me who hasn't shown up yet if you've watched Penn's Pals in the past? Is somebody missing today? I feel like somebody's missing. I do too. I feel like it's Penn. That's right. Where could he be? We have a friend called Pennington. We call him Penn for short and he just loves to read books. That's why he's our friend. And uh, has anybody seen him around the studio today? You haven't seen him? Should we call him? Oh, you have, do you see him? There he is, in his favorite spot, with his nose stuck behind a good book. How many of you ever have to read a book and it's really hard to put it down, like when mom calls you for dinner? How many love to just keep reading? Oh, we've got a great bunch of readers in this group. Well, today, Pennington, we're going to ask that you put that book down. And at this point, we are going to introduce Jason Markey, our local author from Guilford, Connecticut. He wrote this book, Habamic, The Legend of Habamic, The Sleeping Giant. How many know of any other place in Connecticut called The Sleeping Giant? Nobody has heard of The Sleeping Giant in Christian? Ashton, what is the sleeping giant? It's a mountain that looks like a giant sleeping giant. That's right. And without further ado, Jason, we're going to give you the stage so that you can teach Thank us you. more about the sleeping giant. That's exactly right. It does look like a big sleeping giant. Here's a rendition of the cover. It's enlarged. And that certainly looks like a, a giant man sleeping on his back. And that view right now, uh, I want to let you know that the big uh, Native American to the left is actually my main character, Blackbird, in the book, who's grown up. Uh, he's looking back and remembering the stories he had heard about Habamak, the, the stone giant, uh, as told to him by a master storyteller of the Native American clan of the Quinnipiac Indians. And that view is the same view that we have today as what the Native Americans saw 500, even 1,000 years ago. So you think we're coming up on Thanksgiving soon, right? And we've got, uh, what do we do at Thanksgiving? We celebrate, um, as we talked about family and so forth, and we also celebrate when the pilgrims first came to this country, the, uh, from the European countries. 
and how they met with the Native Americans, and they all, the first Thanksgiving is a big dinner that they had together. Uh, so it was the uh, Europeans who first came here who learned to speak the language of the Native Americans, and then in the process of doing so, they learned the legends that the Native Americans had about various landforms in, in the, on, the, on the landscape. And they, one of the legends is to explain why that looks like a giant man sleeping on his back. I have a question for you. How, who's ever walked in the woods and seen a huge boulder, like the, maybe half the size of a house? Have you seen like, something like that? Can you tell me how that, that huge boulder got placed in the woods? Anybody? Yeah, who put it there? Who would have, who, how did it get there? So just think of, uh, go ahead. Maybe God put it there. No, well, that's true, but uh, that, that's one thing, and that's, in the, oh, that's the way the Native Americans thought, too. Well, today we have a thing called science, right? And uh, we know scientifically that glaciers most likely dumped a huge boulder there. As the world got colder and the big ice sheet pushed forward from the north, it would drag all sorts of pieces of mountain and ship pieces of rock off and then deposit them. And then when the ice retreated and melted back, it would drop that stone in the middle of the field. Well, we know that scientifically today. We can explain that, but the Native Americans didn't have any language or didn't have a scientific understanding of anything. So they would come up with myths about how giants would get angry at each other and throw rocks at each other. And they would end up lying out in the field. So there's quite a bit of history. In fact, when I was putting this book together to tell the story, of the Native American legend here, uh, I found out that there's literally stories of hundreds and hundreds of giants. Mm, that's amazing. Did, can anybody think of any giants in stories or literature you've read about or heard about? I can think of one, one who ran around with a big ax. Paul, Paul Bunyan. Bunyan. That's right, Paul Bunyan, yeah. Paul Bunyan was a, a legendary, but he was a good giant, right? He, he ended up working on, he, he's still there. Do you remember what uh, Paul Bunyan's uh, best friend was? It was a blue ox. He was a blue ox, that's right, and blue ox's name was Babe. So that's just uh, an example of a good legend, of a good giant. Does anybody have any examples of bad giants or evil giants that, and, and stories you might have heard? The one about Jack who climbed up a beanstalk. Remember? Fo-fum. Yeah, he was, a, he was a mean giant, so uh, Jack couldn't wait to get away from him. Well, Habamak here, our stone giant right here in Connecticut, was thought to be uh, evil. He was very, very angry and stomped his feet around Connecticut and they had to find a way to put him to sleep. But I didn't think that that was a, a very good legend. I didn't understand why he would just be naturally evil. So that's when I started digging and, and doing more research and I found out that the ancestors of the Quinnipiac Indians today insist that Habamak was really a good stone giant who taught the people how to care for the land and, and, and do good things. And he became angry for a reason, and that's what my story is about. What I want to do before I read it is just talk, mention quickly about folklore, uh, legends and folklore. If you think about uh, why Native Americans came up with the stories that they did, I, I thought I'd look at the words first here. Let's take a look at folklore. Uh, and we look at the definition of folklore and myth. Uh, folklore is a tradition, customs, tales, sayings uh, about art. Uh, I can't even read it upside down. Form. Say, art forms. Yeah, if you could read that for me. Yeah, thank sure, you. it's traditional customs, tales, sayings, or art forms handed down among people. Exactly, and that's basically the definition of folklore. And in mythology, or myth is part of that, uh, myth being a legend. And that's why I've titled this book, The Legend of Habermas because it is one of these uh, traditional stories that explains some fact of nature, uh, usually something that's imaginary, because we know that giants like this aren't real. They're imaginary creatures. So that helps us define folklore and mythology so we can understand a little bit about what the Native Americans thought of the uh, stone giant and this landform as they did. So I'm gonna read this story to you guys now. In days long ago, many Native American people believed that giants made from stone once roamed the earth. One such stone giant was called Habamak. Habamak lived on the long water land with a Native American people who called themselves the Quinnipiac. Like all giants, Habamak ate a lot of food, spoke loud as thunder, and shook the earth when he walked. A young Quinnipiac boy called Blackbird first heard stories about Habamak from his elders. One such elder was Rakaroda, a master storyteller. Can anybody see where uh, that would be? Who would that be? That would be Rakaroda, right? He's the master storyteller. And that's the main character, Blackbird, right there. He's very young and he's first listening to this legend. Habamak was our cultural hero, said Rakaroda to Blackbird and others in his clan. All were seated before a warming fire in the clan's longhouse. 
Habermas taught the Quinnipiac people to hunt and fish, continued the storyteller. He taught them to care for the land and the water. He taught them that all things are sacred. Blackbird listened carefully while Rakarota spoke. When Blackbird lived among our ancestors, the winged people, the birds, the four-legged people, the animals, and the two-legged people, what would that be? Two-legged people? Us, right, the humans. All spoke the same language. Harmony and peace were everywhere. One day, Habamak sailed away in his stone canoe to teach others in faraway lands how to hunt and fish and care for the land. What happened after Habamak went away, Blackbird interrupted. Rakarota smiled at Blackbird. While Habamak was away, Rakarota continued, the land of our ancestors changed. After the sun and moon rose and fell many, many times, the birds and the animals and the humans no longer spoke the same language. They could not understand each other, so fear and distrust came to the Quinnipiac. When Habamak finally returned, he grew, he grew angry at our ancestors. What did he do then, Blackbird asked. To show his anger, Habamak stamped his foot, Rakarota said. He stamped his foot into the long river of pines and made the river change direction. Today, the river still makes a sharp turn where Habamak stamped his foot. What did Habamak do next, Blackbird asked. Blackbird's mother hushed the boy. You were ever the inquisitive one, Rakarota said, and he spoke now directly to Blackbird. Habamak was so angry at our ancestors, he went away again. The legend foretells that Habamak said he would come back and punish our people for not respecting the birds in the sky or the animals in the forest, the storyteller said. After Rakarota finished his story, Blackbird went to sleep and dreamed of the stone giant Habamak. He hoped he would never see Habamak return to punish his people. Many seasons passed, winters, springs, summers, and autumns. When Blackbird was a few years older, he was allowed to journey into the woods on his own. Blackbird nearly forgot about the stone giant Habamak, for Rakarota told many more exciting legends. One morning, Blackbird woke to fill his lungs with the cool morning air and feel the first warm rays of the sun on his face. He put on his leather breechcloth and leggings, slipped on a pair of buckskin moccasins, and grabbed the bows and arrows his father and his grandfather had made for him. Look, we have. After a breakfast of corn, beans, and squash, and fresh, fresh oysters his mother had gathered earlier from the edge of the long water, Blackbird said goodbye to his mother and father for the day and walked into the deep forest alone. But before long, Blackbird spotted a squirrel. He followed the squirrel until a deer appeared in the forest. He followed the deer through the forest until a hawk appeared in the sky. Blackbird followed the hawk along a stream, over a hill, into a valley, and up another hill until he reached the edge of the long river of pines. The hawk disappeared into the treetops on the other side of the river. While Blackbird watched the slow river, he felt a mystical presence. He felt like he was one with the spirit world. Suddenly, his peaceful feelings were shattered when the earth shook him for a moment, followed by silence. The land shook again after the sound of a distant boom. The booming sound continued and drew closer. The, the earth shook more violently after each boom. Blackwood was about to run when the booming sounds stopped. The earth was still again. Blackbird stood very still, for he thought he saw something move among the trees at the edge of the river. The thing that moved did not look like a squirrel or a deer or a bird. Blackbird could not tell what it was among the trees until he heard a loud cracking sound overhead, the sound of large tree branches snapping, and he looked up. There, towering overhead, was a giant man made of stone. Habamak, Blackbird blurted out loud. The stone giant heard the human voice and turned his dark and angular face to look down at Blackbird. Blackbird began to tremble. The giant reached for the boy with his stony fist the size of a boulder, and Blackbird ran. He ran like a frightened deer, away from the river and into the forest. Habamak followed, his stone feet smashing trees like they were twigs. For every 20 running strides that Blackbird took, Habamak drew closer with a single giant step. Can you imagine that, trying to run away from this big giant? Blackbird stopped, drew an arrow from its quiver, and fumbled to place it on the bowstring. Habamak stopped and looked down at Blackbird, who had dropped the arrow and was now frozen still, like a startled rabbit. Why have you come to the edge of this river? thundered Habamak's voice. Blackbird hesitated a moment, then puffed out his chest to make his tiny body look bigger. I have come to hunt and explore, Blackbird said. You cannot hunt along this river, Habamak thundered. This is my river, and your people no longer respect it. You no longer speak the same language as the birds and the animals. I do respect the river. 
Blackbird said, I respect the squirrel I followed and the deer in the forest and the hawk that flew here to the river. I will hear no more, the giant's voice boomed, and he stomped his foot. The ground shook and Blackbird fell backward. He jumped back to his feet unharmed and ran. Hobbamock stomped the ground again and again, crushing tree after tree, looking for Blackbird, but the boy was gone. When Blackbird arrived back at his clan, he ran straight to his mother and father. Where have you been, his mother asked. We heard great thunder in the distance. We were concerned about you, Blackbird. That was not thunder you heard. I went to the river and I saw him. I saw the stone giant Habamak. He was angry and stomped his feet and he told me I could not hunt by the river because our people no longer respect the land and the animals. Where is Rakaroda? I must tell him that Habamak has come back to punish us. Hearing the commotion, Rakaroda had already come to Blackbird's longhouse and he was standing in the doorway. Rakaroda, Rakaroda, Blackbird panted. That was not thunder you heard. The stone giant has returned just as you said he would. Habamak tried to hurt you, Rakaroda said. He tried to grab me, but I ran. And he stomped the trees with his giant stone feet and tried to crush me. Did he see which way you ran? I don't think so, Blackbird said. I ran like my father taught me. I ran like the rabbit in a circle. And then I went off in the opposite direction and came home. That will give us some time, Blackbird's father said but we must stop Habamak before he finds us. There is only one thing we can do to stop Habamak, Rakaroda said. We must summon the good spirit, Caton, and ask for his help. Blackbird's father gathered the elders while Rakaroda gathered his charms, a bear's claw, a fox's tooth, and a bird's foot. The elders, both women and men, sat in a circle around the charms and began to chant. Blackbird sat between his father and grandfather. Together, they chanted the ancient words to summon the good spirit, Caton. Caton could not be seen, but it be, he could be heard in the whispers of the fire that was nearby. The elders asked Caton to cast a spell to stop Habamak from hurting their people. While they chanted, they heard the thunder in the distance and felt the ground shake as Habamak drew closer, looking for Blackbird. Caton knew, however, that giants need a lot of food, and he knew that Habamak's favorite food was oysters. So he cast a sleeping spell on the oysters along the edge of the long water. The booming steps of the giant came closer and closer, then stopped. The elders were silent, ending their chant. They listened. Blackbird left the long house and climbed to the top of a tall oak tree. He whispered down to the others down, who were down below at the base of the tree. I see him, Blackbird said. I see Habamak at the edge of the long water. He's scooping up the oysters and eating. This pleased Rakaroda. What Caton had said from the whispers of the fire was true. Habamak had grown very hungry and he needed to stop for food, for oysters, before continuing his search for Blackbird. Once Blackbird was full of oysters, he yawned and blew out a giant breath. His breath made the treetops sway back and forth. Imagine that big wind. He took three giant steps, shook the ground, stopped and yawned. A thunderous growl came from Habamak's mouth. The giants took two more steps, stopped and yawned again. And then he took one small step, stopped, and lifted his stone hands to his stone face. Habamak stood very still, not moving. He began to teeter, and then he fell to his knees in a thunderous bang. Habamak knelt for a long count, hold, stood holding his hands to his face. His arms then dropped to his sides, and he rolled sideways and fell backwards in one giant explosion of shaking earth. The earth shook so violently, Blackbird fell from a tree, but he grabbed on the branches and broke his fall on the way down. Habamak, the stone giant, lay on his back, fast asleep under the power of Caton's sleeping spell. Habamak cannot punish us now, Blackbird said. He will sleep a long, long time, Rakaroda said, and he smiled at Blackbird. The years passed while Habamak slept. The forest that Blackbird once played in and hunted in grew over Habamak while he slept. When Blackbird grew older and became a father and a grandfather himself, then Rakaroda died and Blackbird took his place as a master storyteller among the Quinnipiac people. Blackbird told his clan of the old legend of the stone giant Habamak as Rakaroda had told it. And he told them of the new legend of the time when Habamak returned to punish Blackbird and his people and how the good spirit Caton cast a sleeping spell on Habamak to put him asleep for a long, long time. Today, Habamak still sleeps. His sleeping body lies beneath a set of hills that form the sleeping giant landform in what is now Hamden, Connecticut. But legend has it 
that one day Caitlin's sleeping spell will wear off, and Habermas will wake up, and the hills that form his head and his body and his legs will be gone. And legend also ha has it that when Hobba Mike wakes up, he will be very, very hungry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Jason, we know you as an author, but can you tell us a little bit about your illustrator? Yes, uh, Jesse Benelli is the illustrator of this book. For, as with any picture book, as you know, the, the pictures are so important. And the, Jesse really brought this story to life. Uh, Jesse recently graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, he received a full scholarship to go there. And I met Jesse when he was just a high school student. He was 17 years old. And I had read an article in the newspaper about how there was this big art show in Lyme, Connecticut going on. So I said, I'm going to go look at all the art and determine whose art I like the best. And I ended up seeing this picture Jesse had painted of himself as a fireman. Beautiful, beautiful pastel painting he had created. So I contacted him, and then we sat down, and I said, I'd love to have you illustrate some books for me. And it took a long time. He didn't start actually working on this book until a few years ago. So that's how I discovered him, and he ended up doing it as a college project. He received full college credit for it, uh, and it really helped start his career going. And I just love it because I thought he captured the uh, essence of the book very well. Are any of you illustrators? How about writers? Are any of yours? Oh, you're right. What, do you, what kind of writing do you do? I do um, fantasy. Oh, fantasy. You're writing uh, fiction, fictional stories. What kind of writing do you do? Times I write about my life and something. Oh, very good. Memoirs. Those, those can sell very well. You can, you, can, you can do very well with memoirs. That's great. Yeah, there's all kinds of writing. I wanted to mention that, but there's so many uh, authors that come on this program, which is wonderful when we talk about books. Uh, I've written poetry in the past. My first published pieces were poetry, and I finally collected them in this book, which came out a year before the Habermas book. But I've also written short stories that have appeared in magazines. And then if you publish enough short stories, you can gather them into books afterwards, standalone books. And I've also written for newspapers. Uh, this is a newspaper I write for quite frequently, uh, various articles. And there's all different ways that a writer can uh, make a living as, as a writer. And I think you mentioned earlier that you were interested in screenplay writing. When you think about how important writers are, sometimes we might not like writing or we have to write assignments for our teachers, but you think about instruction manuals or if when you go to school and read textbooks, writers had to write all of that. So writing is very, very important. And if you think back in the Native American days, they didn't have books at all. They didn't have an alphabet. They didn't have written language, just artistic symbols they would put on their clothing or on baskets. And um, they told their stories through oral storytelling. So we only know the story of Habermas because it was handed down through their generations of people. And then when the early settlers came here and learned their language, they were able to learn the stories then, like Habermas. So this is how we know so much about the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Do any of you have any other questions for Mr. Markey? Yes, sir. How did you get the idea of I love that question. question. I was six years old when I first heard the legend of, uh, uh, about the sleeping giant. I remember driving north on I-91 out of New Haven and my mother pointing and saying, that's sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. And she told me that it was a big giant who was put to sleep and that's all she knew about because he used to stomp around Connecticut. And then I was a volunteer at the Peabody Museum about six years later when I was, and there was a woman I worked with there who was a biology teacher at Wilbur Cross High School. And she told me the legend as she knew it, told, again, through oral tradition, storytelling. So that kind of stuck in my mind, but it would be another 10 years before I would actually sit down and write down the initial idea for this story. And that's when I created the character Blackbird. And all I did was scribble. As I told you before, just start writing and don't worry about editing yourself. And I quickly scribbled down on, on one page a little scene of Blackbird. And I actually came up with the ending of the story right then. Then I didn't have enough experience in writing it, so I put the story away, and I started writing more uh, books and or stories and magazine articles, and then, then I started to publish and sell my poems to magazines. So another 10 years went by, and I realized I was starting to get better at writing, and I wrote a book called The Growing Sweater, which mm -hmm. ended up becoming a lead story in a, a Braille anthology. And I was looking through my files. Uh, I think every writer, when you do your scribbling, you should save everything, and you put them in a file cabinet. And I was just thumbing through that cabinet, and I came across the story of uh, the Habermas page that I had written. 
And I looked at it and I had 10 more years of writing experience. So I said, boy, I can do something with this mm. now. So that's when I sat down and really started to work on the story. I found out I'd have a couple more years of research and I would have to talk to Native American people to try and put as much accuracy into the book as I could. But eventually the story came and then I met the illustrator and uh, it took about four or five years to bring the whole book together. Did you always want to be a writer? No. In fact, when I was young, I hated to read. I didn't like uh, writing. It was very difficult for me. And I had to go to a special reading teacher because I used to move my head when I read all the time. And I had to, I remember her son would hold his hands <laughs> on the side of my head and she'd run a metronome. You know what a metronome is? Yeah. Any musicians the here? Tick -tock. Yeah. Go tick tock back and forth. And he would hold my head while I was supposed to look back and forth between pencils she would hold. And I would try and move my head and then she would make just my eyes move because he would hold my head. <laughs> so that taught me that you're supposed to read just by moving your eyes, not by moving your head. Mm -hmm. And I was, not until I was a senior in high school that I began to like to read more. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother had discovered the works of Ray Bradbury. And that's all usually what it takes if you're a reluctant reader. It takes one writer who has a very unique style or sp speaks to you and then suddenly you fall in love. And that's where I felt when I fell in love with, with the reading was actually I was a senior in high school. Now I wish I had started earlier, but I ended up majoring in English in college and started uh, doing more writing and more reading. And that's when I got all the reading done that I was supposed to do. Now if you had one piece of advice, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of writers in this group. Yep, I was really surprised and, and to and see good that. Readers, yeah. um, and really good readers. So if you could give them one piece of advice now, if between, you know, grade, ages 10 to 13, what would you, what piece of advice would you give them if they want to be a writer? If you want to be a writer, uh, don't edit yourself, which means just let your imagination <laughs> flow. So I see so too many young writers who will start writing and they'll try and get the sentence just right, just perfectly, and you can't do that. You have to explode with ideas. Uh, Ray Bradbury used to call it, jump off a cliff in the morning and then build your wings on the way down. So writing is like that. You want to just plunge into the page and just start writing everything down that you can and let all the words come and the crazy thoughts and sentence fragments, it doesn't matter because you use your intellect later to go back and edit and clean it up. Mm -hmm. That you really destroy the creative process if you don't just let your imagination go and, and not worry about anybody looking at it. Because nobody will look at it until you're ready. Mm -hmm. So that's the advice, is not be afraid to just get your creative ideas down. I call that flicking your English teacher off your shoulder. Maybe, exactly. <laughs> don't let her talk to you in the ear when you're writing until you hand it in. There so. was a, a <laughs> wonderful article I, I read on the Writer's Digest magazine. This woman uh, write, called it tornado outlining or tornado writing. She's just, you want to make like a big wind, whirlwind, and just get everything down on the page and afterwards you clean up it and then straighten everything up. I, well, we do want to thank you, Jason. Thank you very much uh, for, for coming. And 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 you all. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And we thank you and wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you from all of us at Penn Pals. audience. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you would like to know more about our um, show of Pen's Pals, you can find us on www.